welcome to this week's edition of Breeding to Win. Great excitement builds as the Summer Cup will be taking place next Saturday at Turfentain. Of course, it's Joburg's greatest race and I'm looking forward to it with great excitement. The entries look fantastic. We've got some big guns entered like uh, Got the Green Light, Malmoose, War of Athena, Asterix, and uh, sparkling water, just to name but a few. So I'm really looking forward to that. But our very own Julie Alexander and Andrew Bonn tell us a little bit more about the history and the role honor of the Summer Cup. When it comes to horse racing sponsorship, there are three names that stick out head and shoulders above the rest in terms of time span. And I refer in particular to Rothmans, Vodacom and J&B. There have been many other sponsorships that have come to pass in the last decade or so, not least of all the Lormorans Queen's Plate. But the Summer Cup has been devoid of great sponsorship for various different reasons, but still remains Gauteng's most prestigious race. We're going to have a chat to Mike de Kock, who is the winning most trainer as far as the Summer Cup is concerned. Some people will tell you that he's won seven. Some people will tell you that he's won nine and that he's looking for his tenth. But whatever the case may be, there are great horses like Evening Mist and Illa de Vittoria and Flirtation and Wolf Whistle and Ingleside and Delta Form along the way that make out this wonderful entourage of Mike de Kock's winning horses. And we are now going to catch up with Mike and take him back to 1989 when he was victorious with Evening Mist. You know, she was obviously a super filly, Evening Mist. Those days it was a wait for age contest if I remember correctly. It was for a couple of years and then changed back to a handicap and it's changed again now to a condensed handicap. And she was a completely different horse in a soft track. You know, she grew another leg when it rained. Very special obviously, especially in one's first year of training. Well, there was an 11 year break before uh, Delta Form stepped up to the plate. He was a son of Marske and he came from the Western Cape and he won with Guillermo Figueroa, a, a very, very easy win. Delta Form was obviously a pretty good horse, well-bred. I think it's a New Zealand uh, pedigree, if I remember correctly. And he went on to win a Group 1 in America, so he showed his class. Uh, remiss of me not to have mentioned Record Edge because he was a, a son of a rather unfashionable stallion in sunny north, but he had plenty of problems, but boy, oh boy, didn't lack heart. Yeah, he was good. And um, the fact that it was at Gosforth Park was... Um, to his advantage. If it was a turf and teen, he probably wouldn't have run a place, but um, he just scraped time at Gosworth. And, you know, you give many people the question to answer this one, they wouldn't have come up with Carl Nesius. Yeah, well, he was riding quite a bit for me at the time, and it was actually a hell of a ride by him as well, well-timed. Golden Horde was another horse that uh, won this prestigious trophy. He was a soldier made of concrete. Yeah, he was a very good horse. Uh, it wasn't an expensive yearling, funny enough. Um, and very versatile, 1,200 to 2,000. Gave me a lot of pleasure uh, training him. Then uh, another very tough horse, and a horse that uh, one of your best friends trained, and you took him to more heights, more great heights, in Ingleside. Yeah, Ingleside was also um, a hell of a character, a nice horse, and um, was left behind here for me to train when Pat went to Singapore. But uh, also very honest. Um, in fact, he may still even be running around somewhere at uh, in the town on the farm there. I think Bernard still, still looks after him and uh, he'd be well in his in his 20s. I think Record Edges and Golden Horde are also out there. Or well, one of them's passed. It could be Record Edge, but I think Golden Horde's still running around on a farm in the town. And then, of course, the bull of a horse that was just incredible. He ended up going to Dubai. He ended up becoming a lead horse. The very, very tough son of Badgerland, Wolf Whistle. Yes, uh, yeah, for quite a, an illustrious partnership as well. Tough as you say, and it was a hell of a, a duel between him and uh, oh, Yardom. Yeah, it was very enjoyable to watch. Yeah, Pierce Stratum and Kevin Shea giving it all. Yeah, it was uh, no, it was that's that's good hard racing, and not giving an inch. Rudra, who won in an absolute common canter, given Kevin Shea another one in the Summer Cup. Rudra in the black cap hits the front with 300 metres left to go. Kevin Shea has bounced Rudra into the lead. He's shot two, three lengths clear. Senya Versace behind those. Princess Saad, Smart Bank is running on now. But it's Rudra, it's too late for the rest. Kevin Shea is looking around and Rudra is going to take Summer Cup victory. Yeah, another horse that liked it soft, a really good... A great partnership unfortunately two of those partners have passed on but it was also a very memorable memorable day uh, in fact i think the late chris Gerber could have proposed to bridget that day i think there's there's some connection but yeah that forever will be remembered and then quite possibly the most sensational commentary and the most sensational performance from a filly that was drawn 20 
She came from dead, motherless last. She tore them apart, Illa de Vittoria. Yeah, that was a super win. Again, a filly that liked a bit of rain, funny enough. And if I remember correct, it could have been her last start. She was a very special filly to train, that's for sure. I, one of the more pleasurable horses uh, I've trained in my, in my time, and that she was a, a great character, a lot of personality, very intelligent. Um, and I think Mary will agree that it was, you know, as an owner to own a little filly like her, albeit she could run second many, many times. The highs she gave us were just unbelievably high. Flirtation popped up for Costa Levanas. It's a commentary that I'm sure Nico Cruciotis, with his good sense of humour, will not remember with great fondness. Yeah, Nico didn't get the trip. She did. Um, but it was a... I mean, she was also a pretty, pretty decent filly in her day. She could be a little in and out. Um, but there was also a big one. She beat Mother Russia at that time, which was a super filly. Just to skim briefly over the four winners that you've had, going back to Aslan in those very distinctive purple colours, to, to Liege, to Zilzal, and of course to Tilbury Fort in those very bright yellow colours. They're all special, I'm sure, to win Gauteng's premier race, pre premier handicap. Is there any one of those horses that, that really was particularly special to Sean Terry? Well, I think... Um Obviously, Zilzal was a horse that we always thought very highly of and earmarked the race a long way out. And he had got there off a quiet victory moon run, yet um, we felt a beat of, of his chances. Tilbury Fort was a horse that was just doing well and he just came in at the right handicap at the right time. Almost perfect planning and um, things really going right. Um, you know, was he as good as the others? I'm not sure, but geez, did he did he give us a performance on the day? Um, Liege, I think, also had a, a quiet prep run going into the victory moon. Obviously, really appreciated the rain that we got, and Aslan also had a quiet run going into the victory moon. So, uh, you know, where I'm looking at my horses, have all had that that type of prep where they've. Um, all needed their last runs just to bring them to the absolute peak. That's the way we've gone about it with, with the, the four of them this year. And um, I think there is a, a strong resemblance in the in the preparation that my previous winners have had as to what these have done. So, yes, we can only hold thumbs. Well, to put the lid in it, um, there's an old expression that says, if it works, don't fix it. And you've never, ever had a very, very buoyant early part of November. But boy, oh boy, when the end of November comes, Team Terry has really been on song. Yeah, it's always a time of the year where we like to, um, you know, start producing the goods because you can only get them ready for so long. Then they've got to start delivering. Uh, sure, I've had a few bumps in the road this season and uh, I'm sure a few people could probably forgive me for having a, a quiet uh, start to November. However, I do believe things are in place and on track and... Yeah, we're ready to make progress. Well, we heard from Andrew Barn about the trainers that have dictated the Summer Cup over the last couple of years, the likes of Mike DeCock and Sean Terry. Well, I'm joined here this afternoon with Orman Ferraris, who not only has trained a Summer Cup winner, but is going to chat to us a little bit about the history of the Summer Cup. Well, Mr. Ferraris, firstly, it's an absolute pleasure to have you on the Breeding to Win show, and lovely to be for you to be back at Turfentine Racecourse. Yeah, thanks very much, Judy. Uh, I'm enjoying it. Uh, I must be quite honest with you and say I wasn't enjoying my retirement. I can imagine. It's very difficult to get horse racing out the blood, and especially a man like you who's been up at the track, I think, from 4 o'clock in the morning to all hours of the night, and uh, then obviously just to stop completely. Yes, it, uh, it was unfortunate, but that was staff. You know, unfortunately, mm. that happened. You know what happened. Uh, I've been here since I was 17 years old at Turfentine. So it's a long history and I've enjoyed every minute. So now you're back in your old office, but as an assistant trainer, I yes. believe. Yes, it's quite strange, actually. <laughs> but uh, Paul is a very kind man. And he, I said to him, I'm so bored. So he says, look, I'll give you a few horses. You get on with them. Help me. Well, lovely to have you back, Mr. Ferraris, and let's hope we see you on the track soon. 
Yes, let's hope so. In, the, in number one box, that's where it counts most. <laughs> okay, but now take us through the Summer Cup history because you're a man that's been around for many years and the Summer Cup should be as prestigious as the Vodacom Durban July and the Met. However, over the last couple of decades, it changed its name and it lost its little bit of stigma of the Summer Cup. I think that's the problem, you know... Uh, our Summer Cup was like the July and the Met in the Cape. But then, as you say, the name has changed five times. So people have really forgotten about it because what was the Summer Cup? And what is it today? So hopefully it'll come back to that prestige that it had. Just to let's sit and take us through some of the names that uh, the Summer Cup changed to. Um, it was first the Castle Summer Tankard then the Castle Tankard, then the Holiday Inns, then the Sun International, and then the Administrators Handicap. Sure, so it's changed quite a few no, times over the last... times, you know, it's, it, that's a lot. Now, I know you won one of those races with Sizzling Sun back in 94. Yes, that was Sizzling Sun. Nice horse. He left me when he'd won the, after he'd won the cup, he went to Mauritius, because uh, Henry was a part owner of it was Scott. And unfortunately he got colic and died there in Mauritius. But Mr. Ferraris, looking at the times or the over the years for the Summer Cup, the horses that have won, what type of horse do you need to win the Summer Cup? Well he's got to stay the two thousand meter. That that's that's number one. He's got to be sound and uh, have a bit of a finish, not a one pacer. So obviously Sizzling Sun had all that and um, yes, very he, decent sort. He was well ridden by Wai Shung Moing, uh, who I considered a very good rider, strong in a finish. And he produced a hell of a finish with him to get up and win. Just looking back at the stakes in that of those races, I mean, when you compare it to the fees, that, or the training fees, I mean, the stakes were pretty decent in those days. Very good. I mean, you, when you picked up uh, a stake in those days, you could see, go somewhere with it. Mm. Today, as you say, with the high cost of things, it's very hard to come out. And I think that's why we're not attracting people into the game. You yeah, know, there's nothing for to look to. You've got to fork out every month, and fees are high today because of high wages, high feed costs, transport costs. And people say, no, it's not a proposition. Mm. So hopefully those stakes will get back. I know World Sports Betting has upped the stake for, to a, another million rand, so it's a two million rand summer cup this year, which helps a little bit. Oh, yes. No, it, uh, you know, six months ago it was looking very, very bleak. So thank God they have come up. Absolutely. Just going back to Sizzling Sun's win, I know it was a year that um, you won the championship. Yes, I did. It was, uh, I had a lovely string of horses. I've never had more than 60 horses ever. And um, I really, I was turning out the winners. Everyone was asking, well, what's he using? <laughs> you know, that's the usual. As they did? As, as, <laughs> so, thank God, no, nothing all clear. And uh, I, I really enjoyed it. Well, we love to have you back in the game. And like I said, we look forward to seeing you at the races. I know you've got a small string, but at least it's keeping you busy. Absolutely, yeah. I, I, I'm determined to be in that number one box, that's for sure. I'm not doing this just for the sake of health. I've got to show a bit of a profit. Well, you're looking fantastic. Your health looks good, and may it continue, Mr. Ferraris. Thank you, Judy. Thanks very much, and uh, nice seeing you people, and please, God, the racing will go up, uh, up and up. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Commentator Alistair Cohen recently left our shores for a stint in Dubai. He's been there a month, he's loving it, doing really well, and of course we're missing him here in South Africa. I absolutely love his commentary. He makes a race sound so exciting and he's just phenomenal at what he does. But Julie Alexander had him on the line from Dubai this week to catch up with him and just see how he's getting on in Dubai. Well, it's my pleasure to welcome Alistair Cohen all the way from Dubai here on the Breeding to Win show. Al, well, you've only been there a couple of weeks. How's it going? Yeah, Jules, thanks so much for having me. Um, it's been quite an adjustment, I won't lie. Um, first of all, just the weather. Uh, everyone tells me that it's a, a good 10 to 15 degrees cooler than it was six weeks ago. I'm battling to adjust. It is, it's still very, very warm. And we've just begun, they say, winter here. 
Um, I'd hate to know. I'd hate to know what summer is like. Um, but yeah, just getting my my head around uh, things. The roads are pretty confusing. In fact, that's that's already one embarrassing story. One of a few embarrassing stories I've got in Dubai. Laura King, who's obviously um, presents on the Dubai Racing Channel, uh, was bringing me back from Sharjah with her husband the other day, and I said, "Oh, whoever designed the roads here needs to have a real think about himself." And her husband looked at me and said, "Well, I've been doing that for the last ten years." So, hey. so <laughs> yeah, so so that's just one of the stories. But um, yeah, the, it's taking me a, t- a bit of time just to get my bearings. But it, now that I've had my car for about a week, um, things are getting a little bit easier in that regard. I know how to get from the hotel to Maidan. I'm not staying at the Maidan Hotel for those that actually know that there's a hotel at Maidan. So so don't think I'm that switched off. But um, yeah, every day is easier now that racing has started. A, a few mm. Maidan meetings down. Uh, been to Abu Dhabi a few times, been to Elaine a few times, been to Jebel Ali a few times, done Sharjah once. So, so now that racing's got underway, I'm a lot more settled and uh, I'm just really looking forward to the carnival, which begins uh, early next year. Well, I can imagine. And just racing wise, Al, how different is it to South Africa? Really different. Um, the purebred Arabians that uh, run at Elaine, at Abu Dhabi, and at Sharjah. Um, the first meeting I actually called the Pure Red Arabians was at Sharjah. I remember at the end of the meeting, I went down to the boardroom because we all in the same office, all the staffs, the judges, mm-hmm. uh, the clerk scales, the vet, we all in the same office. But after the meeting, I went down to the boardroom. I said, guys, I'm sorry, if you listen to my commentaries and they sound wrong, you know, I apologize. And they said, what are you talking about? I said, well, for example, one race, a horse started well, went to the front. Next call, it was about 11th out of 14. Then it was third at the top of the straights and ran ninth. I mean, how can I always do that? I said, that's Arabians. You know, they do that. I promise you. And obviously, after calling a few meetings subsequently, I realized that there's absolutely no order. They'll take the bit whenever they're ready and, mm. and they'll run their race when they decide they want to run their race. As far as the thoroughbreds are concerned, obviously, until the carnival begins, it's pretty bread and butter um, a lot of horses that are trying to qualify for the carnival they obviously need their ratings to get to a certain point to get into the carnival so for now probably got what mr 90 at best horses going around to try and get okay. into the hundreds to get into the carnival um but i have seen a list of the godolphin horses of uh, potential horses that might be in the next shipment and that will be very exciting okay we're going to talk about that just a little later but for now with commentating, obviously learning the horses, learning the trainers. I mean, it's pretty much starting from scratch for you. Totally. Um, that would have been my answer. It's going back to the reset button, learning new colors, learning new riding styles, um, Arabic names for the Arabian horses. Mm. Um, it's just, it's. It, I didn't actually think it would be that difficult to go back to zero. I honestly thought, well, my eyes and I've been commentating every meeting on the half halt and a PE for the last 18 months, how hard can it be to, to just sort of get your iron and get straight back onto the onto the horse, to use that cliche? It has been difficult, I'm not gonna lie. And also what you do find is that owners tend to run their horses against each other a lot. Um, so Ernst Hotel trains for um, for one of the sheiks here. Uh, Ernst Hotel obviously formerly training in South Africa. Mm. And, they, um, and more than one race on one race meeting, he can easily have uh, five horses in a race. And they all sure. start with M. They all bred by the same place. They're all in the same colors. Um, so that can be a bit tricky. So is it very much like South Africa that just the caps change? Yeah, the caps do change. And at least they're published in the race card beforehand, as opposed to the clock of scales telling you before the jockeys come out that, mm. for example, Tag O'Shea has got a red cap and uh, and Pat Dobbs is wearing a blue cap. That's all disseminated when the uh, when the card goes to print. So th- that's one advantage. Um, it would be really, really difficult if uh, they did it like South Africa. But I guess back in, in SA, you know, you'd get maybe um, three Finico courses in a race, mm. you know, once, once a day on a feature day, um, as opposed to five horses in three different races on a card sure it's crazy but they love their racing there um i know when i went it's, it's just an amazing vibe and of course now that carnival is going to be starting um next year al for you i know it's going to be a whole new experience for you experiencing that just on its own it's crazy because Maidan is so big and you kind of think, well, how is this place going to generate an atmosphere? And I've obviously been told that when it comes to Dubai World Cup and, and Super Saturday, it's a completely different kettle of fish. 
But even for what I've seen so far at Maidan, which doesn't have the grade one races for now, um, you can still feel that you're in a special place where all the eyes are. There's a lot of people that, that turn up to the races and fun. They're nowhere near me because I'm on the sixth floor. But you can still feel when they turn for home that, you know, and there's no obviously no betting of, um, mm. allowed in the UAE. They're shouting for their favorites. They're shouting for their fancies or their yards, whatever the case may be. Um, so there was a really good turnout. And obviously, we can't race at 100% capacity for now. It's currently capped at 70%. And there was nowhere near 70% full of the meetings that I've gone to. But, you know, the point is you can feel that that excitement, you know, from mm. the sixth level. Um, Jebel Ali, um, the first meeting, no one was allowed on course. They just missed that um, cutoff from the UAE government. So the second meeting, when there was 70% capacity allowed, it felt like there was 100% um, capacity at Jebel Ali. The stand was packed. Um, every, it's, it's, it's a very picnic vibe. So, so people come with their picnic baskets and sit on the lawns and, and enjoy that. And they also they have their prayer session before the first race gets underway. So, so you, you turn up and, and they're doing that. I mean, obviously, Friday's, Friday's um, the Catholic religious Sunday. Religious day. And, mm. Yes, the religious day here. And, and they're doing their thing before races and... Then the family's all there and they're picnicking and they're shouting home their favorites. So it's been a huge adjustment just from the cultural side, not just the racing. Well, where I am, there's not a hell of a lot of locals. So, I mean, I'm in, I'm in a hotel where they all the seasonal staff are booked and all the jockeys are booked. I mean, the trainers come out, they'll come here if they want. Obviously, made on hotel would be a lot more convenient. But if they are here for the long term, then, then with I'm the glad you just I'm going to stop you there because I'm glad you're in a hotel. I was wondering who was doing your cooking for you. Um, I'm trying to cook. Thankfully, Candice gave me a few lessons <laughs> before I left. Candice is a very good cook. Um, the last couple of weeks, though, it has become quite a student vibe. So uh, lots of fruit, lots of two-minute noodles, um, biscuits, th things like that, <laughs> cereal, cereal in the morning. So I have got quite lazy on the, the actual thing. But at the start, I tried my hand at a few pastas. It's not quite like home, but it was edible, and I'm still here, so I didn't kill myself. So you're staying in a hotel. Are you going to be in the hotel for a while, or are you going to be looking to move into an apartment soon? Um, no, I'm in the hotel until the end of the season. Um, that's the gig here with all the seasonal staff. So um, a lot of the um, international department that come out obviously for the season are here. The starters, the handers, the jockeys are here. Okay. Um, none of the trainers have come in here yet, but obviously when their horses start arriving and when they're getting prepped for the big races, then there'll they'll be one or two that uh, that comes to stay here. So, so there are a lot of racing people that I see mm. there today. So it's actually quite people, nice because people, you're surrounded... People. So you're yeah, right, surrounded that, by racing. Mm. Yeah, and from that point of view, to answer your question, I'm not really exposed to, to all the different cultures that might be around here because uh, obviously the Western presence that is in this hotel. Mm. I'll just looking at the trainers and the way the trainers train their horses, have you been or managed to get to the track work and uh, seen any of that? It? it doesn't look it doesn't look too dissimilar to uh, to what I'm used to. Certainly at Maidan, um, obviously I was with Mike Decock quite a few mornings when mm. he's been out. Thank goodness he's been here because uh, you know getting a little bit of home has has helped a lot. Um, but as far as I can see, no, not much of a change. Obviously, when you go to uh, establishments like Sharjah and uh, to the trainers that are based out uh, at Abu Dhabi, um, I'd assume that the training regimes would be slightly different. And they also tend to run their horses a lot. So I don't think there'd be too much, um, you know, work in between runs. But with that said, it doesn't look too foreign to me. Okay. So looking forward now, obviously, and looking towards the carnival, horses that have caught your eye at the moment that you think, well, this could be something special? I saw a list of Godolphin's horses that actually arrived this week. Um, there's a horse that ran in a listed race at Newbury a few weeks ago. He's by Dubawi. I've actually the name's just a Sovereign Prince. Sovereign Prince. Nice name. Mm. Mm. Very, very nice name. As a two-year-old, so obviously just it's a rising, uh, com um, coming into its three-year-old campaign. Well, obviously, they, they turn a year older on the 1st of January here. Um, that's a horse that, that initially caught my eye. But with regard to uh, the big guns and whether you know, horses that won in Dubai World Cup nights will be coming up for the season, that I don't know yet. They wouldn't have arrived yet. So, mm. like I said, obviously the horses that are trying to qualify for the carnival are going around now, and those that will be sort of 
prepping into the big races on Super Saturday and into World Cup now. They'll be coming out in the next couple of months. So, so it's very hard to get a gauge of what's around at the moment. All I know is that uh, there's talk that there are going to be a few cool more horses coming out. Obviously, the Americans are starting to say, right, keep 10 bonds for us uh, available and, and 15 bonds at Millennium Stables, whatever the case, whichever bonds they might be going to. So they're starting to say that, you know, allocate that for us. They haven't told us who's coming yet, but uh, mm. you also know with Americans, with Godolphin, with potentially Coolmore, with those types of yards, are there going to be some big guns on the way? Well, we, we hope to catch up with you closer to Maidan Carnival, and uh, I'm sure you'll fill us in on all that info, and especially for the South African punters. Great, and uh, yeah, from a South African perspective, uh, obviously Mike de Kock's got uh, Najum Sahail, uh, Marshall, Celtic Voyager, Majestic Mumbo is still here, uh, Garrelis, who was formerly trained by Glenn Cotson, just arrived. So there are a few South African horses that are, are creeping through, and uh, hopefully in a couple of years' time, there'll be some more. Let's hope. I'm sure they're very close to your heart. I'll, even though you're not trying not to be biased, they, you kind of lean towards that South African connection. Put it like this, if they look like winning 200 metres out, you'll know. <laughs> well, lovely chatting to you. I know you're missing home. I know you're missing Candice a lot. And we're definitely missing you. But it's great catching up with you. And like I said, we look forward to catching up with you next year. Jules, awesome. Thanks so much for the time. I really appreciate it. And uh, good to see you again. Absolutely. Thanks to Alistair Cohen. Well, they certainly were some interesting inserts on today's show, and I'm looking forward to next week's show. We've got some interesting inserts up our sleeve for this coming week. So that's a wrap for today's show. We look forward to seeing you next week on Breeding to Win.